Welcome to this episode of the Doug Sanquist Podcast. Where interested is interesting, and interesting people share their stories and build their biographies along the way. I'm your host, Dr. Doug Sanquist. I'm a dentist and a photographer, and now a podcast host. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and now Clubhouse with the tag with the name at Doug Sanquist, and on Facebook at Doug Sanquist Photo. And you can join our email list by going to DougSanquistPodcast.com. Today's guest is Dr. Philip Ovedia. Hey, Philip, how you doing today? Hey, Doug, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. And as with all of our guests, I don't have a bio in front of me, and I have, haven't read Philip's bio, but I will tell you that I've interacted with Philip on a few online uh, places like Twitter and, and now Clubhouse, and I've found his story relatively uh, um, entertaining and, and interesting, and I can't wait to hear more about it. And of course, that's the goal of our podcast, is, just, is, to, is to discover Philip's real biography. You okay with that, Philip? I am, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. All right. So to start, I have a list of 10 quick and easy starter questions. There are no maybes here. All right. So number one, gummy bears or M&Ms? So, you know, it's been a long time since I had either, but when I did, it was M&Ms, usually peanut. All right. Sweet or salty? Salty, definitely. Hot or cold? Hot. Would you ever wear flip-flops to Disney World? I live in Florida, and no, I would never wear flip-flops to Disney World. <laughs> You'd be surprised at how many times I've heard yes to that question. <laughs> it's scary. <laughs> I know. Are you an early riser or a night owl? I am a night owl that's usually forced to rise early. <laughs> <laughs> Do you prefer a cow or a chicken? Definitely cow. I hope um, you mean to eat, not, but either way. <laughs> yes, to eat, yes. I mean... I, I guess if you wanted to raise them, you could the same way too, I guess, right? Maybe I've chicken's actually considered that. Yeah. Really? But yeah. Short hair or long hair? Uh, definitely short hair, if any. All right. Tattoos, yay or nay? Nay. Uh, coffee or tea? Loads and loads of coffee. <laughs> cake or pie? Uh, again, not something I do often, but when I do, it's usually cake. All right. And a bonus question sauerkraut, love it or hate it? Uh, I actually have come to love sauerkraut. All right. I, that's kind of me too. I didn't really like it as a child, but I think I have learned, I've learned, I like the little tang of it. it. It's a nice topping to some, to many dishes. Yeah, me, me either. I used to never like it, but I've come to learn the importance of fermented foods and, and I have come to enjoy sauerkraut. All right, cool. All right, Philip. So what is your earliest childhood memory? I would say uh, my earliest childhood memories are probably uh, when my brother got sick with type one diabetes and just kind of, uh, you know, him being in the hospital and uh, the, the sort of interactions around that. That'd be tough. I mean, how old were you? Uh, so I was about uh, four or five. Uh, he was about eight at the time, seven or eight. And uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, again, as a child, you don't, maybe recognize the gravity of the situation. And in retrospect, it's probably one of the influences that led me to becoming a physician. Although again, not something that I necessarily recognized as such at the time, uh, but uh, it was certainly, you know, I, I could certainly appreciate sort of the stress in my family at that time. So how long was he in the hospital for after his first diagnosis? It was only a couple of days after his initial diagnosis that he was in the hospital, but then, you know, there were obviously a lot of sort of changes in, in how our family uh, lived and functioned uh, around that. So I, I would say it certainly was sort of a influential thing in my early life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, uh, my roommate in college was a type one diabetic. And I mean, it's a life altering thing for a child. I mean, it's like a, like the whole world is up the whole world as a unit is upset at that moment right yeah certainly certainly and i think my family you know did handle it very well and uh, i certainly uh, give a lot of credit to my parents and 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 to my brother obviously uh and, and you know he's continued to do well uh in life in general and and stay as 
you know, relatively healthy for a type one diabetic. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, I, I think my family did a good job in that. I didn't, you know, it certainly wasn't any sort of, uh, although it, I guess it was stressful, it wasn't like a overwhelming stress and we still had, you know, very normal yeah. childhoods. That's good. Happy childhood. Which that leads me to very, my next question. What were your summers like as a kid? Uh, my summers were, uh, were pretty good as a kid. You know, we live, I grew up on Long Island in New York. Uh, so there was plenty of beach time. I, you know, it was, it, it seems, uh, like pretty much every day during the summer, you know, was going to the beach club. And I remember my mom, uh, would always be pay, playing, uh, Mahjong with her friends, uh, on the beach and, uh, had some cousins and, uh, you know, her, her friends, children that we all kind of would interact as a group. And, and, uh, so it was very good. And, you know, I would do some camps and stuff like that, but, uh, overall I would say we had good, good summers as a kid. That's cool. Yeah. Those are, those are like the summers that, uh, that, uh, they sound like a lot of fun, you know, just good memories from those experiences, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So what was your uh, first job? My first job, uh, let's see, I was a paper boy growing up. I, I did that. Uh, and then uh, I did actually, you know, during uh, some summers, I, I would do some summer jobs actually working in the local uh, schools, uh, kind of uh, with the, uh, you know, um, custodial crew uh, are some of the early things I remember. But I, I think the paper boy was probably the first, you know, true job for me that's cool i always wanted to be a paper boy and then for some reason i never i never did maybe i did deal with growing up in las vegas and it was just terribly hot and got too lazy after that <laughs> yeah it, it was a lot a lot of time on the bicycle yeah i just remember my paper boy he tried to shove his i mean sh um, stuff as many papers in his like, he could barely ride the bike i don't even know how he did it you know just because he had to get all the papers in his bike to make sure he got around the neighborhood you know yeah yeah sunday sundays were always the challenge uh thankfully my parents uh you know a lot of time would drive me around on those days but you had to get up real early sunday morning put all the papers together because you know all the coupon sections and yeah. stuff came separately and then you had to those were big papers to lug around and deliver yeah did you ever have to do like sell the paper paper to the people too if like uh do you ever have to do that because i've i've known some people who did paper routes that actually collect money sometimes from some paper companies i mean or newspapers you know did they ever have to um do yeah you know i remember collecting money uh i don't really remember at any point like going door to door to try and convince people to subscribe right. to the paper that's cool but you had to collect the bill once in a while yeah, yeah that's cool yeah so growing up was uh, in your family was going to college pretty much a given? Was that like a was that like a ingrained in your head like at an early age that college was was on your plate or Yeah, it pretty much was. Uh both my parents have master's degrees. Uh you know, my mom was a teacher uh and my dad although his his degree was in engineering although he was really more of a just a businessman entrepreneur uh throughout my growing up but but college was pretty much a given in my family. So how did you decide what to study? So, uh, you know, my parents will uh, tell, you know, everyone that, uh, you know, as young as they can remember, uh, as, and certainly as young as I can remember, I always said I wanted to be a surgeon, interestingly. Uh, not that I wanted to be a doctor, that I wanted to be a surgeon. Uh, and uh, so uh, there was really never any question. Uh, and although I didn't perhaps have a good reason when people would ask. I was the first doctor in my family. So it wasn't that I was mirroring someone in my family. Mm -hmm. uh, it just was something I always knew. And like I said, maybe in retrospect, it, it was something around my brother's illness. But uh, it's pretty interesting. Like I said, that, you know, I always said I wanted to be a surgeon, not that I wanted to be a doctor. And that guided me. And, and as I went through all the various experiences in my life, so for instance, you know, during high school, I volunteered at the hospital and, and things around that. And uh, I never, never wavered from that initial thought. Wow. That's interesting. So from like high school on like, or earlier on than that was, you want to be a surgeon? That was, that was like, that was it, huh? 
Yeah, actually, real early. I mean, my my parents always tell the story. Uh, I can't say I've actually verified this, but uh, when I was a, a very young child, uh, people would ask what I wanted to do, and apparently, at some point, I would say I wanted to be a sturgeon <laughs> instead of a surgeon. <laughs> I love that. But yeah, so as long as I can remember, I, that was really my only, uh, the only thing I thought about doing with my life. That's interesting because I had no idea what I was going to do when I went to college. And so I thought I, w- I thought I, a friend of mine, a friend of the family's, his, um, he was a heart surgeon. And I remember this is back in the seventies and early eighties that he had a car phone and I'm like, well, he had a car phone and he was a heart surgeon. So I'm going to go to college to be a heart surgeon just because he had a car phone like there's some s- stupid reason like that and <laughs> like like he would ever go to college just to have a car phone right and so so one of my friends said um well why don't you go um you should go down to the hospital and um become a phlebotomist and actually learn how to you know take blood in college and actually learn the hospital and all that kind of stuff and and i'm like I couldn't walk into the hospital because I didn't like the hospital. And then the thought of like just taking blood on people just drove me nuts. I'm like, that was that day I decided I'm not going to go to medical school and I'm not going to be a surgeon. So then I decided to go to dental school instead. So that was my, that was, I was for a moment, I was going to be a heart surgeon and then it's flipped a switch. And I'm like, I'm not going that direction. (laughs) I I think uh, you probably chose well. Yeah. I, I, uh, like I said, I, I, always gravitated towards uh, doing things in medicine and, and I took opportunities to try and, you know, get into the hospital and, and volunteer and, and I just enjoyed everything uh, about it and, and thankfully never had that sort of queasy experience that a lot of people do uh, to the point that uh, when I was in college, I had to have uh, surgery on my hand. Mm-hmm. And I remember uh, see, you know, talking to the surgeon beforehand, uh, this was an orthopedic ham surgeon, and I said, uh, can I, you know, can I watch the surgery? <laughs> He's like, well, I've never had anyone do that before, but, you know, the surgery is done under, you know, kind of local, local. what's called yeah. a, a beer block, you know, where they do an arm block. And, mm-hmm. and uh, so he said, sure. And I did it. You know, they kind of got started with the surgery. And at one point he lowered the drapes and, and it, it's a very bizarre feeling because you know obviously I was under some sedation Mm -hmm. and I you don't feel anything in your arm and I'm looking at this cut open hand that's my hand and uh, it it was kind of a bizarre experience I would say for anyone else but I I loved it and and uh, obviously I still went on to become a surgeon so did you have any fears after that surgery of not being able to be a surgeon because of the hand injury or was that was that was a pretty minor thing no, well, it wasn't uh, exactly a minor thing. So I had a uh, benign tumor uh, that had grown in the nerve in my forefinger uh, on my right hand. And the uh, doctor said, you know, he told me you are not going to have feeling, you know, full feeling in that finger. Uh, but he said, I don't see that's any reason that you can't, you know, still do what you want to do. And, and mm-hmm. it never has hampered me. I just have a, I have a very small area near the tip of the finger that I, you know, if you test it, I don't have perfect feeling, yeah. but I have full use of the hand and the finger and, and it's never really interfered with anything I had to do as a surgeon. Yeah. So how did you pick heart surgery? So I initially was uh, thinking, uh, you know, real initially before I got to medical school, I was thinking about neurosurgery And then as I went through school, you know, I just sort of gravitated more towards uh, general surgery. And uh, I did. So when I was doing it, it was still a separate training program. You did general surgery first, and then Mm -hmm. you went into your specialty. That's changed a little bit since then. But I went through general surgery. And uh, the first, first kind of experience I had with cardiac surgery, I immediately was just you know, this is the field for me, Mm -hmm. Uh, the combination of technical expertise that's required, along with the physiologic knowledge, you know, that's required, it just kind of pulled it all together, uh, the best for me, and, uh, and I gravitated towards cardiac surgery, and was uh, thankfully able to get a a fellowship spot, a training spot in cardiac surgery, and uh, I, I truly do enjoy what I do, and I do continue to find it you know, both intellectually and technically challenging, mm-hmm. uh, and, and very rewarding work. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. So how do you how do you uh, square? Uh, well, yeah. How do you how do you square? Uh, you know, all of the world of you know what causes heart disease now with you know what what you do because you pretty much just cut out vessels and put new ones in, basically, right? Yeah, yeah, basically kind of reroute the blood around blockages is, is our most common operation. So um, a, as you know, uh, I've come to take a very different view on what causes heart disease than, than most uh, doctors and most heart surgeons. Uh, and, uh, you know, my own personal battle with obesity and prediabetes had led me down a path of, of learning about uh, low carbohydrate nutrition and the influence of, of, you know, what I now come to realize is metabolic health on causing chronic conditions such as heart disease, diabetes, uh, and obesity. And so I, I no longer really buy into the paradox, the paradigm that cholesterol is the true cause of heart disease or elevated, you know, specifically LDL cholesterol is the true cause of heart disease. I think uh, LDL plays a part in the pathway, but that pathway starts with poor metabolic health, which is largely related to poor diet and, uh, and nutrition. Mm -hmm. uh, so I now um, am a uh, mostly carnivore. I eat a diet that is very low in carbohydrates uh, and very heavily based on well, first of all, it's totally based on whole real foods and it's very, very heavily based on animal based products. So how, how big were you at your, at your height? Uh, at so your, not height, but at your, yeah. <laughs> at the height of your weight. Yeah. So I, <laughs> I am uh, five foot seven and at my heaviest, I was probably around 275, uh, maybe even a little bit higher, uh, a little bit heavier than that. And uh, I had always been obese, even as a child. Uh, and, you know, thinking back, uh, I realized that, uh, you know, my family ate according to the food guidelines. Obviously, with a type one diabetic brother, we did not have any sugar in the house. Mm -hmm. Everything was uh, low fat. Um, you know, we had margarine instead of butter. We had skim milk only. We didn't have any of the sugary cereals. Whole we, grain bread. Whole seven, grain seven bread. Grade bread. Yep, all of that uh, diet soda for, you know, any soda that we drank. And uh, I was very active as a child. I played sports, you know, always uh, year round. I was always involved in some sport. Uh, I, you know, oftentimes walked to school. I rode my bike to my friend's house. So I was very active and, and uh, you know, had what was supposed to be a healthy diet. And despite that, I, you know, got increasingly obese throughout my childhood and it got even worse, you know, college. Uh, medical school. Um, it got to the point, uh, you know, at one point during my general surgery residency, I was making rounds one day with the team and I got the worst chest pains of my life. I was convinced I was having a heart attack. Turned out in retrospect, just to be probably heartburn. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I kind of at that, that, that made me take a little bit of pause. And, uh, and it was also uh, around that time that I uh, rotated on the uh, bariatric surgery uh, service, the obesity surgery service, and uh, just, you know, realized that my numbers at that time would quali qu would have qualified me to have obesity surgery. Mm -hmm. So I did, you know, I did what I knew to do, you know, cut calories, counted calories. Interestingly, it was I had just gotten my first uh, Palm Pilot device mm -hmm. and I had downloaded an app and I tracked everything I ate and, you know, cut my calories drastically and, and started going to the gym and exercising. And I did lose a lot of weight at that time. Uh, the joke, this was my uh, chief resident year uh, of my general surgery. And, and so, you know, at the end of the year, we had the graduation dinner and, and the running joke during the dinner was, you know, Dr. Ovedia is the first is the first guy to go through this program and leave as half the man that he started as, um, you know, type thing. Uh, but then I gained the weight back and, and, you know, I went through that cycle more than once, certainly with Up all the down. traditional, you know, weight watchers and all those types of things. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and then I found myself at, at 40 years old, uh, had two young children and, uh, just, uh, you know, by this time, both my parents had had gastric bypass surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, but I just kind of 
I, you know, I sort of accepted what is the mainstream thinking that, you know, I was genetically determined to be obese and it just, you know, was the way it was. And then I was thankful, uh, you know, to be uh, turned on to kind of low carb world. I heard Gary Taubes uh, deliver a lecture at the uh, Society of Thoracic Surgeons meeting one year and the light bulb just clicked and I read his books, you know, why we get fat and the case against sugar. And uh, one thing led to another. And, and over the past five years, I, I've completely turned around my, my health. Mm -hmm. Isn't it amazing how you can actually grow up in a, in a diabetic type one diabetic home where sugar is literally like kept to a minimum the sugar that we know, you know, that we're eating, but the, there's so much hidden sugar in everything else that's that's there that we look at and they said, you know, like, again, the seven grain whole bread that everybody thinks is, you know, harvest bread or whatever, that that's supposed to be good for us. But it's as much sugar as a table as a, you know, few spoonfuls of sugar, right? I mean, yeah, it's even worse in some regards. And, and that's exactly it. You know, my, my parents, uh, you know, were under the impression that they were giving us a healthy breakfast every mm -hmm. morning with our bowl of either Wheaties, Corn Flakes or Cheerios uh, mm -hmm. with skim milk. And, you know, we it, with, you know, oftentimes a piece of toast uh, with margarine on the side and, and a glass of orange juice, maybe. And, and that was a healthy breakfast, you know, mm -hmm. and the food pyramid the USDA guidelines would certainly have you believe that that is a healthy breakfast. So why do we still, I mean, with all the data that we have, I guess, well, you know, like we won't get into the topic of, of actual science, but because I mean, that's a topic for another day, but it's like, I mean, when you look at like, you know, from the implementation of the food pyramid, like what's happened to like the obesity numbers in, you know, just America have just been astronomical ever since that they've plugged that in. It's like, how come we don't even need science to tell us that it's not working. So I don't really understand why we, ha why we're still having, for instance, I, I mean, I have celiac disease. I've had it for like 10 years. And so having a, having celiac disease is a, is a difficult autoimmune disease because the physicians don't actually want to treat you. I mean, they don't, my GI doc who diagnosed it basically told me after on my follow-up visit that I basically knew more about it than he did after looking, reading about it online for like seven days, you know, between the time that I, and he doesn't, he didn't really, he doesn't really want to treat me anymore. Cause I can't, you know, there's nothing he can do. And it's just, it's the frustrating part is, so then, you know, you get that diagnosis, then you go see your cardiologist and then your cardiologist says you should lose 10 pounds. And then he gives you the food pyramid, like, you know, registered dietitian plan of how to lose 10 pounds. And I'm like, I can't eat the food that's on this list. You know? yeah. <laughs> and, and it's like, it's so frustrating that, th that this is where we're at in 2021. And um, like, you know, the government's still just, you know, pumping this out that this is a where, you know, like, how did we, why, how did we get to think that that was a good idea? I guess that's the question, you know? Well, you know, I think it, it went back to, uh, you know, early on in the process, uh, there was some uh, misinterpretation, we'll call it, you know, some people would view that as in, it was intentional, some people would say it wasn't, but there was some misinterpretation around the early uh, data on cholesterol and its effect on our health. And that became the focus of, you know, as the heart uh, disease uh, numbers started getting worse uh, in this country and the obesity you know, kind of uh, numbers started getting worse, the focus became on low fat. And the natural sort of, um, you know, unintended consequence of taking fat out of food is you got to add carbohydrates or else no one's going to eat them. Right. Uh, you know, you got to, you got to substitute something when you lower something else. You have to add uh, and salt and sugar for it to taste good. If you don't exactly. Take the fat out. Exactly. So, you know, by going low fat, we unintentionally went high carb and the whole sort of food industry pivoted around that and got behind that. And again, you can you know, talk about whether or not that was an intentional or unintentional act, but that's what happened. And then when the results weren't as expected of that, as we started to see, despite that, you know, the obesity continued to go up, diabetes continued to go up, heart disease continued to go up. 
the thinking became, well, we're just not doing it well enough. So, you know, we got to lower even more. We got to, you know, and the other part of the thinking, which also was erroneous, but, you know, was part of the thinking was people aren't listening to us is the reason it's not working. And those two things kind of fed into each other. And here we are 40 years later and, you know, the country is more obese and more metabolically unhealthy than it's ever been. But now we just have this, our whole food system from the government incentives to what the, the, you know, the farms grow to, ha- you know, the types of food that the food industry produces is all geared towards, you know, this sort of low fat centric cholesterol centric model. And uh, at this point, it, it's almost like the, you know, the beast is too big to, to stop feeding it, mm-hmm. um, you know, and uh, again, I think a lot of people are, are you know, have misaligned incentives. Uh, you know, when you look at the healthcare system as a whole, it is not incentivized to keep people healthy. It is no. incentivized to take care of people who are already sick. Uh, and, and quite frankly, that that doesn't serve, uh, you know, the, the people well, but it's just how the system has evolved. And I think at this point, that's what we're dealing with. We're really, it's really a sick care. It's not really health care. It's pretty much just putting a bandaid on the things that are, that we can put a bandaid on at some point. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. And so, uh, that, that makes it very difficult for, for doctors, uh, in particular who now want to go outside that paradigm and, and, you know, doctors like myself and, and there are, a, you know, a, an increasing number of doctors like me, uh, who kind of have come to realize, you know, the importance you know, I, I, for, I always try and tell people it's not even about, you know, I, I believe low carb is the best way, uh, mm-hmm. but it's not even about that. I really would just prefer that we just start having the discussion of food influences health, our mm-hmm. diet influences our health, and the conversation can't even get to that part. No. You know, the, the immediate thinking in medicine these days is if you are not healthy, we have to find the medication the Mm -hmm. surgery, the treatment of some sort to fix it. And the the, no one even, you know, we we don't even get to that first step of saying, wait, you know, could this have something to do with the way you eat and the foods that you eat? Right. And and so I'm hopeful that we can at least even start to have that discussion. And then we can get into the whole discussion of, okay, what is the best food to eat? And I understand that people might have different interpretations of that. And, and the answer, quite frankly, is probably different for different people in different situations. But at least let's start having the conversation of the food we eat influences our health. Uh, and it's amazing that we can't even have that conversation for the most part. I mean, you walk into a doctor's office and you can't even have that a conversation very often. I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't really get that, but it is interesting that you, what you, I mean, cause I was raised I was raised as a vegetarian. And so I was raised in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And so of course that's their health message. And what was always interesting to me was the Seventh-day Adventist never, um, you know, no meat. It was like their health message. Um, But if you look at the Levitical laws, I mean, from the Old Testament, I mean, there are clean and unclean meats. And so it always just was just an interesting thing to me that they actually created their own food, you know, their own, you know, I mean, the Adventists were pretty much the people who actually created the veggie food. I mean, that's pretty much where they, you know, out of Kellogg and all those places, you know, that's pretty much where that all came from. And so it's an interesting, it's an interesting how, um, you know, their system is actually looked upon as like a model of, of health. I mean, the Loma Linda study, I mean, the study from Loma Linda and the, you know, people that have, you know, people over a hundred years old out of Loma Linda, California and those sorts of things. Um, it's an interesting topic. I mean, it's an interesting, I don't really know if there's any answers to that, but I wonder if it's as much diet as it is other things at some well, level. Yeah. And I, I, I do think there are other things as well. And actually the Loma Linda study is a very good example of that uh, because while, you know, their diet was part of it, you know, so the Loma Linda study, for instance, you know, usually gets put out there as it shows that a vegan diet or a heavily vegetarian diet, uh, you know, is beneficial for health. And the two things that are interesting about it is, first of all, you know, the Seventh-day Adventists have a a lot of other habits that Mm -hmm. promote health. They don't smoke. 
They largely don't drink. They have a good community mm -hmm. uh, interaction. You know, they're active. They tend to be more physically active. Um, and so it's not just their diet. And then, you know, the other thing about their diet is you can look at it two ways. You know, you can say, okay, the vegetarian sort of based diet is the most, most healthy, or you can say, you know, which I think is a more accurate statement, the more accurate way to frame it is the vegetarian, you know, based diet is more healthy than the standard American mm -hmm. diet. Yeah. But it might not be the most healthy. But again, I, you know, I think it is definitely an improvement over the standard American diet. Especially if it was, you know, stuck to whole foods and, you know, things like that. I mean, I think it's, there's definitely a benefit. There's def there definitely can be a benefit to it for sure. You know, you definitely yes. not. I mean, you know, I think whole foods, I mean, part of my celiac journey is like, how do you, you know, as somebody who was raised in that is like, well, you think of like wheat as a whole food, but you don't really think of wheat as like a processed food. You know, you don't think of wheat as being like a hybrid, like, you know, the Persians and Egyptians way back when actually took grasses from the, and actually hybridized them. So, I mean, it's not really, it's kind of like Franken, Franken food from way back when, you know? Yeah. And that's what makes, you know, studying nutrition so complicated because, you know, you say something like wheat and wheat can mean lots of different things. You know, the, the wheat that we eat generally in the United States these days is a lot different than the wheat that our ancestors in Europe were eating, you know, 300 years ago. Right. So, uh, and how we've, and how we've been able to like, you know, maximize the crops and all that kind of stuff, you know? So exactly. I mean, it's, it's definitely an interesting, so would you call your, would you call your, um, your health and your, your success, I mean, your, your diet, your greatest success so far? Yes, I, I think I would. Well, I, I mean, you know, my greatest success in life so far is, is, you know, my two wonderful children and, uh, you know, my wonderful wife, I would say is my greatest success and, uh, what I hope to we'll be call my those greatest a we'll, legacy. We'll, we'll call those a given. <laughs> yeah, well, or maybe we call them a gift. Uh, but yes, I think, I, I think that, you know, ultimately, uh, what I'm most proud of currently, and what I'm most passionate about currently is, you know, the sort of renewed focus in my career on metabolic health, and trying to get that message uh, to, to an increasing number of uh, patients and just an increasing audience. So are you 100% convinced that if somebody's on the ticket for heart surgery by you, that you could turn them around? Well, you know, so unfortunately, when they come to the time of heart surgery, it's often too late to undo the damage to their heart. So they may still require the heart surgery. Mm -hmm. Usually they do still require the heart surgery. Mm -hmm. But I have that conversation with them now that, listen, you know, the heart surgery is just a Band-Aid. You know, we are literally laying new pipe, doing the bypasses, mm -hmm. rerouting the blood around the blockages. We can't undo the blockages at this point. Mm -hmm. But moving forward, you have to change something or you're going to end up in the same situation again. And the data shows that, you know, many people who have heart surgery end up needing further work on their heart, um, you know, whether it's more stents or redo surgery or, or whatever else down the line. Uh, and again, I think you know, that again, just points to the failures of the system, because we do these very involved surgeries, obviously life threatening surgeries that consume large amounts of resources from the health system, very expensive. Mm -hmm. And we put these people on all these medications afterwards, you know, with the expectation that, okay, you know, that the statin is supposed to take care of their problems. It lowers their cholesterol and, and therefore their heart disease should be fixed. And the reality is, is that most people still end up either dying from their heart disease or, or having further problems in their life, you know, with heart disease. So again, a logical person, I think, looks at that and says, we, we, we have to be missing something. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, this is, again, in retrospect, what's most interesting to me, because admittedly, I never thought to question this until, you know, recently. And it really took people outside of the medical system who I started interacting with in the low carb space, people who were engineers and computer scientists that that looked at this and said, you know, you're missing the root cause. 
Mm -hmm. You know, we never in medicine, we we don't think about that root cause. And, uh, you know, we said heart disease, cholesterol causes heart disease. Yet, you know, again, in retrospect, I think back probably half of the patients I operate on have low or normal cholesterol levels. Mm -hmm. Some of them, because they're on medications, a lot of them, they're not even on statin or cholesterol lowering medications, and they just naturally have low cholesterol levels. And yet they're still here getting heart surgery. Mm -hmm. And I never thought to question that until I started questioning that. And, And again, you know, the, the engineers and the computer scientists look at that problem and say, if there's an exception to the rule, the rule is broken. Mm -hmm. In medicine, we tend to say, well, everyone's individual, there are genetic factors, and -hmm. and we come up with all these other sort of uh, reasons. Uh, But I I now come to realize, and actually we have the data to show this, which is even more interesting. You know, it's just that this data kind of gets buried or forgotten. Uh, But back in the 1980s and and 1990s, before the whole cholesterol sort of, uh, you know, mantra took over, they did the studies on, you know, people coming in with heart disease and 90% of them are insulin resistant, uh, you know, and uh, so we have the data that shows that metabolic disease is really, you know, the, the true root cause. We've just, that data got buried and ignored once the whole cholesterol mantra took over. So how would you dis- how would you define metabolic disease for like the lay person? Like how do you what do you think about when you think about metabolic disease? What do you how do you describe that to a lay person? Yeah, so basically to me metabolic disease means that your body is able to properly process and handle the you know, the food, the nutrition that you're taking in. Uh, so, you know, it, a certain amount of the food we consume is supposed to go towards fueling our body for all the activities we do. A certain amount is supposed to go into building and rebuilding tissues. And then a certain amount is supposed to go into temporary storage so that if times come up and and certainly ancestrally they did, that food wasn't readily available, we had a reserve to live off of. Mm -hmm. The problem is we no longer get into food shortage situations for the vast majority of humans. Obviously, there is still, you know, famine and starvation and and malnutrition, uh, but most of us don't experience that. And therefore, and that in combination with, you know, some of the effects that processed foods have on our system, we never tap into those food storages anymore. And they just build and build over time until they're, you know, at at the point that, they become truly toxic to our bodies. So what do you, I mean, I mean, wouldn't you say that the, most of the, I don't want to throw all the dietitians under the bus, but I mean, wouldn't you say most of the mainstream, you know, diet mantra is still around counting, counting calories and things like that. I mean, isn't that yeah, still pretty it, much the, the mantra today? I mean, so yep, it's, it's counting calories and it's food pyramid still. So, do we do that because we don't have any way to push ourselves away from the table? You think, and we don't because we don't we have a, an abundance of food. Is that the reason that, that that's out there? You think, or is? Um, I think that's part of it. I think it's you know ultimately largely that the you know the food industry has become probably the primary driver of the food policy in this mm-hmm. country. Uh, when you look at the people who sit on the committee that every year, this, every five years revise the nutritional guidelines, it, it's heavily in, influenced by the food and the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, so I think that's, that's certainly part of the problem. And then, of course, you know, all of the dietitians, all of the physicians uh, get, you know, educated based on that. You know, that, that's our whole system. It's hard to you can't get official medical education that goes outside of that. You know, I, I, on my own, went outside of that and and discovered different information, but within the system, you know, you simply can't get information that's contrary to the, to the food guidelines, the food pyramid, you know, the, the food that gets served in hospitals to patients has to be in line with the food guidelines. You know, it's part of the, uh, you know, it's sort of one of the criteria to get, to get any funding, you know, to get paid 
by, you know, government insurance, you pretty much have to follow these food guidelines. So the whole why system- why they include Jell-O on the, in the, in the hospital food menu. <laughs> yes, and, and why the morning after heart surgery, I routinely walk in and my patients who are getting insulin through an IV have a plate full of oatmeal and pancakes and orange juice and, you know, a 90% carbohydrate meal in front of them while the insulin is pumping in. Yeah, it's, do you think we can change that? Do you think that can uh, be changed? You know, I, I'm, I'm optimistic that, you know, one at a time, there are increasing number of physicians who are open to it and the patients are increasingly, you know, becoming aware of it and demanding it. Uh, and I think it, it's gonna have to be a grassroots sort of ground up move, you know, ground up uh, movement. And that, that takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort. And, you know, it can be very discouraging to look at the system as a whole, but I just, uh, you know, I, I try and advocate for my patients the best I can. I've tried and start, you know, I try and educate the general public in the different ways that I can and becoming more active in social media. I, I have my metabolic health telemedicine practice that I've started to help people that are interested in, uh, you know, in improving their metabolic health. So I'm trying to do what I can, and I'm involved in a number of organizations that are trying to, you know, kind of coordinate the efforts of physicians and interested uh, non-physicians to to do the same. So I'm hopeful over time, we're going to have success in that. I mean, it's, it's, it's a step in the right direction for sure. So how do you tell that patient who is looking at, um, heart surgery, they're going to, you're going to do the heart surgery. And then you say you need to make some changes. And then you tell them the changes they need to make is to eat like steak, three meals a day and no sugar. Like what, what are they like? Cause everyone's going to say, doc, you're crazy. I'm not eating like steak, three meals a day. I'm not going to, you know, and, and, and honestly, I don't tell them that, you know, so I, I, you know, while I myself choose carnivore and, you know, honestly, I think it is. Uh, well, let's, just, let's just stop right here for a second. Just explain yeah. what a carnivore diet is. Oh, sure. So, yeah, uh, you know, for the past, uh, so for the past five years, uh, I have been, you know, generally what people would call low carb. Uh, I went through sort of, uh, you know, what most people would call keto. And then for the past two years, I have been eating ex- almost exclusively animal-based products. Uh, So I eat meat, fish, seafood, dairy, and eggs, essentially. And uh, I don't eat, uh, I, through, because of that, I don't eat carbohydrates in any significant quantities. And uh, the other thing I try my best to avoid is artificial fats, uh, the the vegetable and seed oils. So So that's what I- Cook your own food for the most part. Uh, yeah, or, or, you know, when you eat out, you avoid the fried foods and, and uh, you know, nothing's 100%, but it's as, as good as I can do. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's had great results for me. But that doesn't mean that I think that's the only healthy way to eat. Mm-hmm. The framework that I try to explain to patients is get back to eating real food. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that's sort of the number one message I try to get to them. You know, think how your grandparents and your great grandparents ate, uh, you know know what is in your food. If it has more than three ingredients, you probably shouldn't be eating it. And if you can't pronounce some of those ingredients, you definitely shouldn't be eating it. Uh, So if you just get back to whole real food, I think there is room for, you know, debate. And I think it is going to be different for different people. You know, how much of that is animal based, how much of that is plant based. There's probably some, you know, some wiggle room there. Uh, But I think if we just got back to eating whole real food, our health as a nation, you know, as a, as, as humans would vastly improve. And so that's usually kind of how I start my messaging, but it's interesting, you know, when you, when I sit down with people facing heart surgery, they're oftentimes very open to this message because they understand that whatever they've been doing didn't work, gotten to the point of needing heart surgery. So it didn't work. Uh, and and a lot of them say, you know, oh, uh, you know, I don't understand. I've been doing everything my doctor told me, you know, I've been eating low fat. I've been taking my statin medication and, and, you know, you have to, you know, have that discussion. And, and I am frank with them. I'm saying, listen, we thought, you know, meaning we as doctors, as the healthcare system, we thought that low, 
low fat was the going to be the way to go. And, and unfortunately, it hasn't played out that way. And we have evidence that, you know, this other way, it, it, you know, might be a better answer. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I do my best to try and influence them. Uh, I don't force anything on patients, you know, honestly, you know, I always tell them, I'm not here as your doctor to tell you what you should do. I'm right. here to try and educate you and help you in what you want to do. And, and that goes as far as heart surgery. You know, quite frankly, some patients have significant blockages in their arteries. And, you know, I know the data shows that they would be best served by doing heart surgery. And they just say, I do not want heart surgery for whatever reason. And, and you know, I'm not, I'm not here to force anyone to do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the root of the Latin, you know, the phys physician, the root in Latin, you know, basically translates to teacher or mm -hmm. educator. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we've got into a very, uh, you know, kind of prescriptive system and it, it's top down, you know, the doctors get told you need to practice medicine by the check boxes, mm -hmm. evidence-based medicine, it always gets called. Right. Uh, but that doesn't leave room for, you know, realizing that people are different and there is no one right answer for anything for everyone. Right. Uh, so. I, I actually really like that because, um, you know, I don't believe there is one diet for everybody. I think it's the, the diet, you know, that works for you is the one that you'll do, you know, yep. and, and finding that one is the one that, you know, and we're all different. We're all going to react to certain things. We're all going to, we all have different sensitivities. What do you think about food testing? What do you think about like the, you know, the, there's like those panels, the IgG testing and things like that, that are out there that, you know, I mean, in my world, that's, it's kind of a big deal because, you know, we do it. Yeah. You know, you know I, I think I'm not a huge fan of them for, for a couple of different reasons. I think, first of all, they're contextual. So, you know, if I had tested myself five years ago and I tested myself today, mm -hmm. I think the results of those food tests would be very different. Right. Uh, you know, I don't disagree. Uh, and, you know, it has a lot to do with various factors, your microbiome and just mm -hmm. your physiology, uh, depending on what you're already eating. So for that reason, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of them. I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of food testing in the sense of, you know, having people be intentional about eliminating or adding back certain foods to their diet and really paying attention to how they feel and how that influences their health. Uh, again, just taking the step back and saying diet influences health. So pay attention to, I eat certain foods and I feel a certain way. Mm -hmm. And if we just started doing that more, I, I think that that would be a big help to all of us. Yeah. And I think, and I think the only way to actually do that is to actually, you have to actually have to be able to part and parse out what it is that you're eating. I mean, so if you're eating you know, a burger and fries, there's like a thousand different like ingredients in that burger and fries that you yes. don't even know that you're eating. And that's, that's actually where that actually comes down. So if you, if you have, yeah, that, and, and honestly, that's the problem with all of almost all of our science on nutrition is exactly right. that, you know, uh, so typically, you know, most of the science we have around nutrition relies on sort of food recall, food diaries, and, and yeah, you know, the person reports they ate a burger and fries. And in the, re in the final report, it ends up they ate meat, and they had this bad outcome. And right. you know, so meat is bad for your health. But the reality is, is they ate the burger with the bun with the toppings with the fries that were made with vegetable oil. Right. And so, you know, and the I, burger I was cooked in vegetable oil, and the burger had yep. cheese inside of it. And the burger had, you know, in the in the bun had, you know, a thousand ingredients to make a bun that would actually sit on the shelf for like two weeks so that we could, you know, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, that's an interesting, I, I like, I, I like thinking about it that way because a lot of times we don't even know, I mean, just my own experience. I, I literally went to work for the first 10 years as a dentist, like with a stomach ache every single day. And it wasn't until, you know, pretty much a sensitivity to wheat and, you know, a bad diet that pretty much led me to work with a stomach ache every day. I thought I was just afraid to go to work, you know, the anxiety of going to work, but really it's just, it's food, you know, and it's, yeah. And, and, and that's exactly it. And, you know, I, I was 40 years old and, and, you know, my joints hurt every day when I got out of bed and I was tired, I would, you know, be falling asleep in the middle of the afternoon. And I just thought, Oh, this is how, you know, again, 
we we've one of the other large problems I see in healthcare or, or you know just in society is that people don't even expect to be healthy anymore. Right. Uh, you know, there everyone thinks it's normal because the vast majority of people by the time they're 50 years old are on multiple medications. Mm -hmm. And so everyone just says, well, that's just part of the aging process. And you say, but, but wait, <laughs> you know, 50 year olds, you know, 50 and 100 years ago weren't on all these medications. And, you know, you look at, so at societies that are sort of more, you know, ancestral, I guess, or, you know, haven't had some of these influences, you know, in terms of their food supply and people are healthy for most of their life until they die. You know, now it's expected that basically you're going to spend the last, you know, third of your life unhealthy, you know, on medications, in hospitals, in assisted living facilities, uh, you know, all of this stuff. And again, I just wish we would step back and say, you know, why can't we be healthy for the vast majority of our life. You know, I always say, and I, I borrowed this quote from someone who unfortunately, I don't even remember who it is to give them credit anymore. But you know, my goal is to die young as late as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I, I want to I want to be healthy until I drop dead, basically, and not have to spend the last 20 years of my life, you know, in the healthcare system. Right. And that's, that's really where we're at right now. I mean, I have patients who are 60 years old who say, well, doc, I'm not going to live that long. And I'm like, well, you're only 60 years old. I mean, it's like, there's no reason we shouldn't be able to, you know, be healthy to a hundred these days. You know, I mean, right. it's, there's no reason that we, we, don't, we have the data. We know what to do. We just, you know, we, it, it's just, what do you think about bullet, bulletproof coffee? What's your ideas on that? So, you know, I think uh, a bulletproof coffee and, and for those in the audience that don't know, that's usually, you know, basically coffee with added fat to it. So things like uh, butter or uh, coconut oil, oil MCT oil. Um, I think it can be a useful tool as you're transitioning off of a high carbohydrate diet. You know, so again, you need to get your energy either from carbohydrates or fat. Those are the only real energy sources in our food supply. Uh, so I think it can be a useful tool as you're transitioning. Uh, but ultimately, if you have excess fat, with the which the vast majority of us do, uh, it is better to burn your body fat than just be adding mm -hmm. unnecessary fats to your diet. So I'm not a big fan of it long term, but I think it is a good uh, tool during the transition period for someone who's, you know, kind of adopting a low carb diet. I got you. Good. As a way to uh, hold them over. Yeah. And it, it, it really does help your body to sort of, you know, you have to train your body essentially to run off of fat because we're all used to running off of sugar. Well, I think uh, the idea so. is like to go to, to get into inter intermittent fasting. So where you go like eight hours and 16 yeah. hours, the, the bulletproof would actually help you get through that. Right. So if you could, if you can make it through 16 hours without actually feeling hungry, you probably don't need it. Is that, yeah, is that it a reason can. Way to think about it? it is. And, and I am a big fan of fasting. Uh, but again, I think I look at it a little different than most. Uh, I'm not a big fan of forcing fasting. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of eating in such a way that you're hungry less often. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you just naturally start to fast uh, intermittent fasting. So, you know, I end up eating once or twice a day. And it's not because I'm forcing myself to eat once or twice a day. It's because I'm only hungry once or twice a day because of the way I eat. And so I what think is a typical, a what is a typical me, uh, day of meals for you? Uh, so, you know, typical day of meals uh, is anywhere from, you know, two to three pounds of, uh, of uh, meat in, you know, either meat or seafood uh, and some eggs, uh, you know, in various combinations. I would say I'm, I'm a big fan of steak. I'm a big fan of seafood. I eat a lot of, uh, you know, shrimp and I live in Florida. So grouper is kind of the local, uh, you know, fish. And I eat a lot of that. And, and that's really it. And, and, you know, a lot of people say, oh, that's so restrictive. That's so boring. And my answer is that's so satisfying. That's mm -hmm. so enjoying, you know, enjoyable to me. And it's a lot simpler. You know, mm -hmm. I realize in retrospect how much of my time, energy, you know, that I spent thinking about food previously. Uh, and now I just don't have to think about food that much. I literally, I, I come home, 
you know, I grab something out of the fridge, I throw it in a pan or on the grill for a few minutes, I eat it, there's minimal cleanup, the shopping is a lot easier, my shopping list is a lot, you know, uh, less than it needs to be my trip through the supermarket when I go to the supermarket is literally just a, a loop around the outside of the supermarket, mm -hmm. you know, grab some meat and seafood and, and dairy, uh, you know, my, my family, you know, eat still eat some fresh vegetables as well so you know you grab some of that and uh you're done and it's just it, it's so much simpler uh and, and so people look at it as restrictive and i i actually find it to be freeing uh, do you eat organ meats too i do i typically uh you know i, I i'll admit i'm not a big fan of liver by itself uh i get uh i, I get some ground beef blends that have uh organs in them uh i actually do find heart uh, very delicious which might be interesting since i'm a heart surgeon uh but uh, it turns out heart is kind of like a lean steak uh and i think most people if they were open to trying it would would uh you know find that palatable uh and then uh you know I, i'm not there are some within the carnivore space that really think organs are essential and to the point that if you don't eat them, you have to take organ supplements. I'm not quite there. Uh, I, I'm not sure. You know, I know a lot of people in the carnivore space who do so without really incorporating any organs and, and they're, they're very healthy. Uh, but I, you know, I, I guess I hedge my bets a little bit and I, I do get a fair amount mixed in with, like I said, the ground beef mm -hmm. blends or, or other organ blends or various sources. And then I also round out my diet. For instance, I think eggs are a very well-rounded mm -hmm. nutrition source. You know, mm -hmm. eggs have everything it takes to make a chicken right. a, a full organism. So sure. I think that's a good nutritional source. I think mixing seafood in, you know, varies the uh, nutrition some. Uh, so I, I, I get my variety that way. And, and so I also eat different meats. I eat, you know, I eat a lot of lamb. I like beef. I'll eat game meats, uh, you know, and things like that. Mm -hmm. you, and you stay away from pork and chicken for the most part? Uh, I eat less of that. Uh, you know, honestly, chicken, uh, to be perfectly honest, I just find boring compared <laughs> to red meat. Uh, you know, and again, that's a personal thing. Uh, the, the, the theoretic concern I have around chicken and pork uh, is that they are non-ruminant animals. And if they are fed poorly, mm -hmm. that ends up being poor quality fats within them. Uh, as opposed to ruminant animals like cows and lamb, for instance, can can actually convert, uh, you know, some of those poor feed sources into uh, better so a, fats. So a grain fed cow could be better than a, you know, poorly fed pig, for instance. Correct. As, as, yeah. as a source. Yeah, the, the, the cow can can sort of, you know, detoxify some of that grain that they're being fed. Uh, would you so, prefer a grass fed, you, you prefer grass fed beef and things like that? Is that your... I prefer it when I get it, but when you actually look at it nutritionally, the difference between grain fed beef and grass fed beef is actually pretty small as opposed to say the difference between, um, you know, uh, chicken and pork, conventionally fed chicken and pork, uh, you know, versus grain fed beef let's say, uh, you know, I, I would much prefer the grain fed beef. And then the difference between grain fed beef and grass fed beef is very small. So I always tell people, you know, get the meat that you A, can afford and B, enjoy the most. Um, but again, even the chicken and pork, I'd rather see someone construct a carnivore diet, let's say, or a low carb diet that's largely chicken and pork than a standard American diet. Mm -hmm. It's still going to be an improvement. Then probably still the diet that I was raised on. So, <laughs> yes, yeah, you know, although, you know, a vegan diet, again, you know, I have friends that are vegan, I, I work with clients that are, you know, vegan. Uh, and, you know, my, my problems with the vegan diet are, first of all, there are mandatory supplements that you need to do. So we do know that there are certain nutrients that you cannot get from animal product from uh, plant products. Mm -hmm. uh, so you need to take supplements. And that's fine. If that's the choice you make, then you, I work with them and say, okay, just, you know, these are the supplements you need and you make sure you're getting all the nutrients. 
And then I just think it, uh, you know, you end up eating a lot more often, you know, mm -hmm. as a vegan. Yeah, you, you uh, and it's you, a you lot more complicated. It is. Yeah. So what, so on a vegan diet, what is your, what is your primary protein source? You know, I mean, beans uh, and, and, uh, soy and things like that i mean yeah pretty much where you yeah. have to go to right which i think is less than ideal you know again there are certain amino acids that you really can't get uh in sufficient quantities from from plant-based proteins as opposed to animal-based proteins so i don't think it's ideal uh but you know again uh, uh you know going back to i'm not here to tell people what to do i'm just here to educate them and uh so i have that discussion with them and i say listen these are the issues that i you know that come up with vegans. And, and so, you know, you have to supplement and, and find your way around them. And then you ultimately have to decide, you know, if, if whatever is driving you to become vegan, you know, to, to continue to be vegan, if that's more important than, you know, optimal health or, you know, that, then, you know, again, it's just how you construct things and, and those choices you make. Uh, but, you know, let me give you the proper information and then you make the choice. That's awesome. I like that. I like that approach because it doesn't really it doesn't really, you know, pin you down to one way. I mean, it can all work. I mean, I think what we got what we said before, I mean, they all work. It's just, you know, as one of my mentors in, in dentistry said, everything works some of the time. Yeah. And so, I mean, <laughs> once you realize that everything works some of the time, then it kind of it's a freeing you know, it's just what works for you, you know, and if you're getting the results you're getting, you know, 10% body fat or 15% body fat or whatever that is with your good metabolic scores, then keep doing what you're doing, right? Other than that, then you need some help. Yes, exactly. And, and again, it, it may change over time, you know, maybe, you know, a couple of years from now, maybe I'll, something will happen and I'll discover that, you know, carnivore isn't the best, you know, no longer is the best thing for me, or I need mm -hmm. to change something. And honestly, even within carnivore, you know, I've, I've changed many things over time. Mm -hmm. You know, I various, uh, I vary certain aspects of the diet. So even within carnivore, which everyone pictures is so restrictive, right. there are still lots of, you know, options Ideas. for me to play around with. So, yeah. Cause uh, I mean, even, even what Paul Saladino, I mean, he, he even eats honey and berries. I mean, which, yeah, exactly. you know, it's, it's, you know, those are, those are hardly, you know, things from animals, right? Right. And, and again, that's why ultimately I'm not a big fan of, of the labels, you know, again, mm -hmm. the, the whole carnivore or, it, you know, you got to be strict keto and that means this, or you got to be strict carnivore and that means this. And again, I just tell people, you know, pay attention to how you feel eating certain foods and eat the foods that make you feel good. Mm -hmm. And I think ultimately, you know, that should be our guide. Uh, I to. I really like that. So what would your current self say to your young self? Um, so I would, two things that I would like to go back and tell my young self. One is always remain curious, you know, mm -hmm. uh, never think you know everything there is to know. Uh, and the other is maybe, you know, uh, be a little less focused at times, you know, so mm -hmm. Uh, I don't really regret much in my life, but when I look back, you know, I was so focused on becoming a physician and getting through the schooling and all that, that, you know, maybe I missed out on some other opportunities in my life, like traveling or when I was younger and things like that. Uh, so, you know, I think goals are important. I think working towards your goals are important. Uh, but sometimes, you know, you, you can, there are, there are things that, maybe don't seem obvious at the time as beneficial towards your ultimate goals that, you know, can be beneficial. Uh, they may seem like distractions, but sometimes they're good opportunities for growth. And, yeah. uh, you know, sometimes we have to pay more attention to those. I like that. What's your greatest fear? Uh, I think my greatest fear, uh, is that, uh, I don't know. I was going to be a little bit sarcastic and say my greatest fear is, is that uh, Kamala Harris uh, succeeds in banning meat uh, in this country. <laughs> or, that, or that any politician uh, but, bans meat. In this yeah, country, any right? politician bans meat, but I know she, she's mentioned it in her platform. So uh, that, that's probably my greatest fear. Uh, but uh yeah, I, I mean, I think ultimately my greatest fear, and so I, I guess I'm doing everything I can to avoid this, is that my children, 
you know, grow up in a world that uh, doesn't provide all the same opportunities, uh, you know, that, that I've had and that they don't, uh, you know, take advantage of those opportunities. Yeah, I, th I can see that. I think that's, I think as it's interesting, I can, I can think of back to my grandparents and my parents who always worried, my grandparents used to always worry about what the future was holding and like what the experiences that I would have. And I think it's just normal as a, as a parent to always think about, you know, will the world be dramatically different? And it may be, but I mean, I think, I think we're both old enough to realize that change is really slow. I mean, yeah, it, it doesn't, yeah. nothing really changes that fast. Right. So, I mean, I don't know. I think there'll still be opportunities, you know? Yeah, I, I think so. And I think it's just a matter of uh, taking, taking advantage, being open mm -hmm. to the, you know, the current the opportunities. The, yeah. Yeah. Where, where, whatever the world is at the time, there's always opportunities that are available out there, you know? I, I so what would you consider well your greatest said. inspiration? Uh, my greatest inspiration is probably my children, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, they, they inspire me to be better every day. Yeah, I can imagine like, um, did you ever have a thought like when you were like, before you started the the latest journey of weight loss of like, you know, would you be there for them? I mean, was that was that like a was that like a, a thought that goes in your brain? I mean, that's a personal question. But I mean, I, I'd imagine I'd have it. Yeah, no, it certainly was. And I think, uh, you know, I, I, I almost wish I had listened to that thought more, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, in retrospect, certainly, uh, you know, that, that has been the greatest benefit I would say to me of getting healthy is that I am more confident that I will be here longer for my children. Uh, and I wish that I, you know, when I wasn't healthy, uh, you know, that that pushed me more to get healthy. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, uh, you know, in some ways I guess it did because, uh, ultimately, you know, I think back and I think that I very easily could have not listened to the information you know, that Gary Todd's was talking about, uh, or, you know, I could have read that book and said, this is all garbage and just continued on my way and, and not gone down the path that I went to. But obviously there was something in my mind that was pushing me to be open to that information mm -hmm. and, uh, ultimately got me to where I am. What other mentors have you had along the way? Um, you know, I mean, I, 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 I've been, uh, inspired by a lot of people, uh, you know, in this low carb space, uh, certainly, you know, uh, Gary Todd's, uh, Tro Collation is another physician who's been very inspirational to me. Brian Lenskis is a great physician who's been very inspirational to me. Sean Baker, uh, you know, those are some of the other low carb physicians, uh, guys like Gary Fetke and Tim Noakes, who, you know, really led the way, um, and then more directly in my life, uh, you know, some of the surgeons uh, that I that I trained under and trained with uh, were, were certainly inspirational to me as well. So what's it what's it like? Um, what's it like um, doing your first graft on a heart? You know, it, it's so it's interesting. The first time I really, you know, kind of sewed it myself. Uh, it was actually, I was a second year uh, general surgery resident and there was a cardiac surgeon that I worked with, uh, you know, at the time. And, and that, that is actually, I would say much earlier in the process than most mm -hmm. people get to do that. Yeah, right. uh, it just, I showed an interest and, and he was, you know, he was the type of surgeon that was very, uh, very good at sort of showing people how to do things, uh, setting everything up so that it, it all worked well for, you know, for people who were training, uh, but I was certainly under his supervision. So that, that was kind of the first time I did it. But again, I was under very close supervision. And then the first time after I completed training, you know, the first time sort of doing it on your own is always a little nerve wracking that you're sort of, you know, you, you've done it that, you know, at that point, I had done it a couple hundred times, um, you know, with, one of my mm -hmm. supervising physicians sort of across the table from me, guiding me. And for the first time you sort of look across the bed and there's, you know, your, your, your assistant, <laughs> yeah, a physician assistant yeah. or a first assistant. And uh, you kind of realize, Oh man, it's all me. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I've always been, uh, I, I guess, fairly confident in my, uh, in my uh, abilities and uh, you know, had good self-confidence. So it wasn't, 
wasn't too stressful a situation. Dude, I can't even, I, I mean, I mean, we do this, I mean, we do the same thing at a much, you know, different level. It's not, the, not a heart, but I mean, it's, you know, still cutting teeth is cutting teeth. I mean, you still have to, you still have to do it, you know, for the first yeah. time. It's like, yeah. you know, it's just, it's, it's interesting. Cause like, I mean, I try to think back to like, you know, how you would, you know, sew on a heart and, you know, cut the vessels apart and then sew a new graft back in there. It's, you know, I can't, it's, it's just hard for me to fathom, but you guys do it all day long, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like any other, you know, highly uh, technical skill. I, I, I mean, I could look at, you know, the photography you do and right. say, you know, I have no idea how to do that. You know, that's very intimidating to me, but you know, you yeah. could easily break it down into steps and kind of teach me how to do it. Uh, You're right. and, and, you know, the technical aspects of heart surgery are the same way, you know, I, I can break that down very well and, and teach someone, you know, the technical steps of heart surgery, the difficult part of heart surgery and, and dentistry and medicine in general is figuring out who to do that on, you know, it, it yeah. really, you know, I always tell people the difficult part of my job isn't doing the heart surgery, the difficult part is deciding who to do the heart yeah. surgery on. Because it, I mean, it could be successful 95% of the time, but if it's that 5% of the time that keeps everybody up at night, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and that's the, uh, that's the, uh, so obviously, uh, I'm guessing the, uh, the health space and moving people forward is that's what's keeping you going now, right? That's like, that's like pretty much the focus of like the rest of your career, right? I mean, if, if you could transition out of doing hearts and not cut another heart, yeah, that'd thrill you, wouldn't it? That's what it sounds like to me. Uh, um, yeah. So, you know, I, I love doing heart surgery. I'm not really prepared to stop doing heart surgery, but, you know, I always, I, I sort of have the, uh, the, the joke that I'm trying to put myself out of business, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. ultimately, yeah, my, I would like my legacy to be that at the end of my career or at the end of my life, you know, because of the work I've done, less people have to have heart surgery. I love that. I mean, I think that's, I mean, I think that's, that is, that's a different take than you'll hear from most, at least physicians that I talk to. I mean, so, I mean, that's kind of the world that I live in. If I didn't have to do any dentistry at all, I mean, that would be, that's where I would like to be. I mean, I know people don't believe that, but, you know, if I don't have to work on people, then that's, then I don't have to do anything that they can keep their teeth forever, you know? So it's kind of like the same thing, you know, but I don't, I think we'll be in business for a, a lot longer because I think the yeah. system, the, system, the yeah. system just doesn't really want that to happen. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately. So, you know, well, Philip, thank you for the, your time. And I guess now is the time when I'm supposed to like, I think you actually just gave an amazing summary of your biography right there. I mean, really, it's just, you know, you're a guy who wanted to be a surgeon his whole entire life for, for whatever reason. And then, uh, you know, along the way you discovered that, uh, you know, the, the education he'd been given was like, you know, not really there. And he figured out that there's a way to actually change his own life. And now he wants to change everybody else's life, which is pretty cool. You know, I think it's cool. You know? Thank you. Thank you. I, I've certainly enjoyed the conversation. Uh, and I just uh, encourage people, uh, come find me. I'm at ovadiahearthealth.com. And uh, I'm on Twitter at ifixhearts. And now I'm in uh, Clubhouse, just under my name, Philip Ovedia, and recently <laughs> on Instagram as well at Ovedia Heart Health. So uh, please, yeah. I love I love interacting with people. So please come find me. Yeah, and those for those that that don't know, I mean, I'm I'm glad he uh, threw that little uh, that little pitch in because his uh, his virtual MD uh, program is uh, it's pretty revolutionary. I mean. You know, I think you're trying to get set up so you have a license in every state. Is that correct? Or you're uh, that, towards that goal? That is an ultimate goal of mine. Uh, but uh, at Ovedia Heart Health, I provide telemedicine care to people anywhere in the United States. Uh, there are some states. Currently, I'm licensed in six states. And so I can provide full medical care in the other states. Uh, there are some limitations. Um, but uh, ultimately, my goal is to be able to provide full medical care to people in all 50 states through either the combination of me getting licensed mm -hmm. in all 50 states or hopefully some legal changes that mm -hmm. are underway that will make the process of practicing medicine uh, via telemedicine a little easier. COVID, I mean, that COVID has actually accelerated that. Yeah, some. that doesn't really make it doesn't make any I mean, if you can do a health, a Medicare, I mean, a televisit 
you know, in your local town, why can't you do it across the state line? It kind of doesn't make any sense that that doesn't exist already, but you know, it's kind of cool that it's available. And so for any, for anybody that is, uh, that, uh, feels like they need to have a doctor reading their labs and watching their progress as they decide to go down a carnivore or low carb diet. I mean, I think, uh, Dr. Ovedia is probably a pretty good resource to at least communicate with and see if that's something that would be interested in, you know, interesting to you, because I think uh, he could help, you know, those that have questions about whether it's legit for them. I think that's, that's, that's the, that's, people are still afraid of that, right? Because their doctor yes. is going to tell them something else, right? Yes, many, many doctors will. Uh, but uh, yes, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm always looking to connect with people. So please, please come find me in all the various places. Well, thank you for uh, your time today. I really, I really enjoyed this. Actually, it was a lot of fun. Um, hope you do too. Um, but uh, thanks for uh, yes. stopping by. Thank, thank you. All right, take care, Phil. Okay, bye.